Hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the 2024 Louise M. Slaughter National DNA Day Lecture. Um, in 2003, Congresswoman Slaughter led a group of legislators who passed a concurrent resolution creating National DNA Day to celebrate the completion of the Human Genome Project and the 50th anniversary of the discovery of DNA's double helix structure. Representative Slaughter passed away in 2018 after a barrier-breaking career dedicated to science and public service. She was one of the earliest champions of genomics on Capitol Hill and a steadfast advocate for policies that have allowed genomics research to advance to where we are today. It is also thanks to her that we have a law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and because it's government, um, the nickname is GINA, or acronym, which prohibits genetic dis discrimination and whose protections allow patients and research participants to undergo genetic and genomic testing without fear that their results will be used to negatively impact their job or access to health insurance. This lecture is intended to engage NHGRI, the broader NIH community, as well as our virtual listeners from around the world with the importance and relevance of genomics in the public sphere, whether it's through genomics education, public or community service, the arts, science communication, policy, entrepreneurship, or other fields, genomic touches virtually every aspect of our lives, and our hope is to inspire you to get involved in genomic literacy initiatives in your communities. With this in mind, we are thrilled to present Dr. Joe Pelka, today's featured speaker. Joe has been a science communicator for nearly four decades, from 1992 to 2022, he was a science correspondent for NPR, National Public Radio. Prior to that, he worked for the, for the new sections of Science and Nature. He also worked as a television producer. He came to journalism from a science background, having received a PhD in psychology from the University of California at Santa Cruz, where he researched human sleep physiology. Dr. Palka has covered a range of science topics, everything from biomedical research to astronomy. He is founder of the NPR SciCommerce program, a collective of science communicators. He has won numerous awards, several of which came with very attractive certificates. <laughs> In 2019, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences with Flora Lichtman Palka as the co-author of Annoying, the Science of What Bugs Us. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Pelka. Gee, the laugh, I'm good. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I, I met Louise Slaughter once, but I don't think she'll remember me. And besides, she's not here, so I guess it's not really relevant. But um, it's very nice to be here. Um, I did give a talk once at, uh, at Lipset Auditorium in the past. And it, it reminded me of, of how different it is to talk on the radio and talk in public for me. Because this woman came up to me after the talk and she said, you know, I came late uh, and I wasn't really sure who was speaking. But then you read from a script that you brought from N NPR from something you'd read on the air and I started reading it. And she said, and, oh, it's Joe Palka. So there's something about the Joe Palka on the radio that's a little bit different from the Joe Palka that's in front of you now. Um, yes. <laughs> so uh, DNA uh, has played a, a lot of a big role in my career. The question I face all the time is figuring out what my audience knows or doesn't know. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you some about today. But I'm also going to talk to you about my interaction with DNA throughout my life. And um, so that's where we're going to start. Now, we went a little too fast. This is 1953. Um, why are we talking? Why are we starting in 1953? Well, um, because, as you all know, this paper, oops, that's, that's the wrong paper. This paper came out in 1953, which is, as you heard, the paper that described the molecular structure of DNA. And 
The other thing that was really, I mean, in some ways, even more significant about 1953 is that I was born. <laughs> uh, my mother assures me this is me. Uh, I was really cute. <laughs> anyway, um, the other thing, we were just fooling around with the slides, and this is my bad. The other, the other thing about 1953 that's kind of interesting is that this paper come out, came out. Now, this isn't nearly the, as earth-shattering as, as the Watson Crick paper, but it's, uh, I'm sure you can't see it too well, but it's the regularly occurring periods of eye mobility and concomitant phenomena during sleep. And it was the paper by Asarinsky and Kleitman that started what we call, what I call, what's called the modern age of sleep research because they described REM sleep, which hadn't been known before. And one of the breakthroughs that got them to REM sleep was that they speeded up the paper through the EEG machine so that they could see these um, ra eye, rapid eye movements in, in, on the page as opposed to having it all going through very small, slowly. So it's interesting where it came from. But the reason that's relevant to me is that I got interested in sleep research, and then I went on and got a PhD in sleep research, but it's no longer relevant to me because I don't do sleep research anymore. Okay. Oh, there it is again. Okay. So the next date that's relevant in this little story of me and, NP and, and um, DNA is this year, 1968. What happened in 1968? This book came out. Now, we're not going to discuss the book or what you think of it or what other people think of it or what you think of the author. But my father was a playwright, and he was always looking for interesting stories. And he read, probably because it got a good review in the New York Times, he read The Double Helix. And he wrote to Jim Watson at Cold Spring Harbor and said that he would like to make this book into a movie. And Watson said, OK, why don't you come out to Cold Spring Harbor and we can talk about it. And my dad came to me and said, what's DNA? <laughs> and I thought, well, if you didn't get it from the book, you're in trouble. But, but that was, I was in high school, so maybe it was a precursor of what was to come. But I tried my best to explain to um, my dad what DNA was. And then he went out to Cold Spring Harbor and met with Watson. And the meeting was successful, but Watson explained to him that this is how my father characterized it. I don't know if it's exactly what happened, but that Crick was very upset with this book and had said that, you know, if anybody tried to turn it into anything else, he would sue or whatever. So Watson wasn't prepared to go along. Of course, somehow, maybe it was after Crick died, I don't know, but um, the, they did make a play or a movie or something like that. But my dad was very good at identifying good yarns, and this was a good yarn. Um, anyway, the next date that's relevant is 1986. Oh, that was 1986. Then comes, oh, no, this is 1986. So this is something that, um, I don't know how well you can see this, is a copy of Nature magazine. Um, and just to make sure you see the byline, this is from May of 1986. And this is by me when I was working. And once upon a time, when you looked up the, um, the timeline of uh, the history of the genome project, this was the first mention in the press that this was a possibility. Now, there was an article later in Science and other uh, op-ed pieces, but this was the first journalist. I was the first journalist to write about the Human Genome Project. Yay! Um, very proud of myself, and I know DOE is going to do a great job with it. <laughs> 1993. Um, so now we are at the, let's see, what is that? 40th anniversary of DNA, and I am now working 86. I was at Nature, 93. I have just started at NPR. And I said to the people at NPR, hey, why don't you send me to this 40th anniversary celebration? It's going to be cool. And it'll be one of the rare opportunities to get Crick and Watson together in the same room. And um, so, they, so NPR said, sure, go up there and do that. So I want to thank. Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, because someone went into the archives and pulled out. This is a picture from the event. And it was really hilarious. Um, there was a press conference with Crick and Watson. And I only had one microphone. And they were sitting at a table next to each other. And I had met 
uh, Crick on a couple of occasions working for Nature. And so I went to him and I said, Francis, see, I'm always friends with people named Francis, right? I said, Francis, Jim mumbles. So when he's talking, can you slide the microphone over to him? And then when he's done, slide it back to you. And he said, sure. And he did it. And if you ever go back and listen to this piece, which you can do, I think, you can hear the microphone slide across the table, which is anathema. I mean, a sound engineer would have a fit, but I think it's kind of cool that you can hear that. Anyway, it was a, it was a fine event, and everybody had a good time, and I did a story. And <clears throat> actually, one of those prizes that you mentioned, this was the first piece I won a prize for. It's a prize that's not given out anymore, and I'm not even going to tell you what it was because nobody knows it, but I did win a prize. Okay, yay me. Fast forward to 2003. Okay, now we're up to the 50th anniversary. And I did a story again about DNA and the human identity. And I saw a picture of Jeff Trent upstairs in, the, in Eric's office, and he was in this piece. It was at a time when people were talking about DNA and biological determinism, and whether you, know, you were your genes or where you could still, still be something else if your genes predispose you to something. And it, that brought me back to a memory of when I went to Nature, a friend of mine said that I should tell them I had a competing offer from Nurture and see if they would give me more money. <laughs> but, but that didn't happen. Anyway, 2023. Ah, we're here. Though why didn't we do the 2013? Because there's, nobody does 60th anniversaries. They do 50th anniversaries. But in 2023, the editors of NPR the editors of All Things Considered, in particular, somebody, I don't know who, because I had already retired, said, wouldn't it be a great idea to repurpose Joe Palka's story from 1993? We have tape of Crick and Watson from, seven, you know, from 30 years ago. It's, there's this great event that happened 70 years ago. Let's do a little piece on the air. Well, that was a good idea in principle. But in practice, it was a bad idea. Because in 1993, Rosalind Franklin was not part of the discussion. She wasn't at the event, but that's because she wasn't alive. That, she might not have been invited anyway, because that was the spirit of the times. But she wasn't there. I didn't mention her. And for the most part, I don't think most people at that time didn't acknowledge her contributions. Now. By 2003, and certainly by 2023, or 2022, or 2014, or however far back I can't prove to you the first time I wrote about Rosalind Franklin being involved, but, or being more than involved, or however you want to think about it, I knew that putting on a piece about the wonderful thing of discovering DNA without saying Rosalind Franklin's name was going to be a huge mistake. Nonetheless, NPR made the mistake. And the next day, 70 years ago, a scientific discovery changed the world. Yay, that's really great, Joe. Except for the fact I wasn't working at NPR. And NPR was flooded with people saying, you didn't talk about Rosalind Franklin, which is true. I didn't. But if they had bothered to check with me or anybody on the science desk at NPR, this was the producers of the show, All Things Considered, they would have found out that this story has a historical inaccuracy. Historical, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have, I could have, I might have, but I didn't. And I certainly would have corrected it had I had a chance in the future. So instead, they put this on the air, and then the flood came in. And so to make everything good, they wrote a post-broadcast clarification. This story, which includes excerpts from a story that aired in 1993, neglects to mention the significant contribution of scientist Rosalind Franklin, who produced the crucial X-ray photograph of DNA that was later used by Watson and Crick. Franklin is widely acknowledged as playing a major role in the discovery of DNA's double helix structure, and in fact published a paper on her findings that accompanied Watson and Crick's research. Now, if you were not being informed by me, Joe Palka, that I didn't put this on the air as written, they did. You would certainly have the feeling that Joe Palka made that mistake and they had to mop up for me. 
And I feel like I was thrown out. Somebody said it was like being hit by a bus without realizing you were on the street. Um, I was not happy. I'm still not happy. Reading it again makes me unhappy. But that's sort of the business we're in. You know, NPR owned everything I ever did, and they can do whatever they wanted with it. They could play it at double speed and make it sound like Alvin the Chipmunk. It's up to them. I didn't think it was journalistically very uh, honorable. Okay, so I hope with that, you'll, you'll accept the fact that I, I'm allowed to talk about DNA. I've been talking about it for a while. So the question that when, when Larry Brody, thank you for inviting me, he went away already. No, he's, well, he was, oh, there he is, okay. When Larry asked me what I want to talk about, I thought, well, I don't know, I'll talk about DNA, I guess. But it got me thinking about this problem that, that, that we face, we, in journalism, face all the time, which is especially, well, we don't, we're not talking to an audience. I can see you nodding. So I know that I'm getting my message across to you, but I can't tell everybody else. And it's worse when you can't see them and you can't ask them and you can't say, Everybody get this? So I began to wonder, do people know what DNA is? And it reminded me that when I started at NPR, I, when I worked at Nature and Science, I didn't bother. I mean, people knew what DNA is. That was an audience I felt fairly secure in writing for. But when I got to NPR, what is DNA? And there was a time when every time the word DNA got mentioned, it would say something about the blueprint of life or some kind of shorthand for this chemical which describes the mechanism by which genetic material is passed from one generation to the next. But we never know. So I started to run around and ask myself, okay, when did people start talking about DNA in the media? Well, there's probably earlier versions, but this is when the New York Times first mentioned the word DNA, which was in July 15, 1947. And then I thought, well, okay, what, what do we know about what people think about DNA? And so does anybody know John Miller at the University of uh, Michigan? Well, he's been studying public understanding of science for a long time and has done a lot in this field and, and very thoughtful too. And <clears throat> so I asked him if he had any data and he shared this with me. So I can't give you all the... Um, uh, background about the kinds of questions he asked. But this was an open question. This starts in 1988, and it's not a perfect time series, so it's the, the distance between bars is not a, a fixed. So there's issues with the slide, but I, I'm not very good at PowerPoint, so forgive me. Um, but the point you can see is it starts in 88 and goes to 2020. And the question was in the survey, and this was a national survey, representative supposedly of national population, Again, I haven't vetted that, I don't know for sure. But the, it was an open question, what is DNA? And then there were various criteria that you had to fulfill in order to get a, you know what DNA is. And the level of knowledge of DNA, you can decide if this is relevant or not, is to be able to read and understand the science section of the New York Times. And so if you go back to 1988, the number is 27.4% in his survey. And I don't know why it drops in 1995, maybe because he stopped doing the survey, I don't know. But as you can see, even, I mean, and, and there's a nice signal in, in 2000 um, when you begin to see the genome project having an impact. And then in 2016, you begin to see CRISPR having an impact, I think, because it got DNA back into the popular consciousness. And now it's continuing to go up. So that's great. That's 55.3% huge increase since 1988. So all that means is about half your audience doesn't know what the hell you're talking about, which is not great if you're trying to talk to them about something that's key to what you're talking about. Now, my point is, and I guess it goes back to what you were saying, there's a need, a pressing, constant need for people such as yourselves, scientists, to help the public understand what the heck it is that you're doing. It's chronic. It doesn't go away. And you can say, I mean, I talked to, I have a scientist in my household. And I said to her, do people know what DNA is? She said, of course they know what DNA is. But they don't. I mean, some do. That's for sure. Half of the population 
can give you an explanation, but a lot of people don't. And they're probably not the people who are listening to this audience or to this talk. They're not this audience, but you're the ones who are in the position to do something about that. And so I felt very strongly all the way through my career, and we don't have to have a debate because I'm up here talking and Les is sitting. <laughs> but, but I have the opinion that it's really incumbent upon scientists to help communicate to the public what they do. They don't have to be, and if they don't want to do it, fine, but don't diss people who do want to do it. Thank them, give them every support they need. That's my opinion. That's where I've put my professional work. That's what you heard about with this NPR SciCommerce. We started that about a decade ago. It's actually moved to Boston University now because NPR lost interest. I, I, I don't blame them. It's not what NPR does. This gets to the question of a news media versus education. This was sort of a public education effort. Boston University, public education or private education, but an institution of higher education makes sense that they would want to do something like this. I'm okay with that, but I think it's really important. And I'm still working on it now in my retirement. I'm trying to help the uh, Schmidt Sciences, which is a philanthropic initiative. No, it's not. It's a philanthropic foundation that's supporting science. They're also supporting science communication, and they've asked me to help them with tools and structures and things like that that'll make scientists better communicators, and, but the ones who want to, and that's fine, and that's what I want to do. So um, that's what I've been doing. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the nature of news and why it doesn't work, why we need scientists involved and why news doesn't work so well as a, as a teaching activity. And so what's the nature of news? Well, here's the slide I put up. I, I always do this big news of 2024. Well, let's see what, I mean, I can sit at my desk and this is what I come up with in, 35 seconds. There's the Middle East. There's the Speaker of the House. There's the Trump indictments. There's the war in Ukraine. There's immigration. There's economy. There's abortion. Supreme Court. There's Taylor Swift. I mean, okay, never mind. That's still big news. But what's the big science news of 2024? What story has happened in the last year, so far this year, where it's only April, so, you know, it's only a quarter of a year, but what's happened so far? that's so important in the world of science that I would be derelict if I called myself a science correspondent and failed to report. Anybody? Don't feel bad, I couldn't come up with anything. And a lot of times the things people come up with was, oh, well, the, 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 um, there was a Mars landing. Well, Mars landing is an engineering trick. Or there was a, a, you know, the James Webb Space Telescope. Or, I mean, I'll give you, there have been the discovery that uh, COVID was caused by a coronavirus. That, that goes into the category of big science news of not 2024. But the point is, they're different beasts. And what becomes science news is sometimes not so much news as cultural. And the, uh, why science becomes news is, again, here's a hint. Frequently, the answer has to do with health. People love stories about their health, and so they gravitate toward this will cure you or this will kill you. And this is a slide I just love because it shows why it's so hard to tell these stories because it's a bad slide. I'll interpret it for you because it's too complicated, but it lists wine, tomatoes, tea, milk, eggs, corn, coffee, butter, reef, and it, each dot represents one medical study, and it's the relative risk of cancer. <laughs> On the right is causes cancer, on the left is protects against cancer. Now, if you do any one of these stories, people, are, you'd be right, it'd be news, it was published in a reputable journal, that's what these papers all were, but it's very confusing because there's another study, study in the next week that says something different. Well, if scientists looks at this and yes, they're amused, but they're not disturbed because that's sort of the way science works. But the public looks at this and think, what a bunch of wing-wangs these guys are. They can't make up their mind about anything. And I'm sympathetic to that. And that's another place where scientists can step in and tell you, look, the reason is blah, blah, blah. I mean, there are different methodologies. There are different ways of measuring. There's different outcomes. These are blunt tools for understanding 
relationships. Anyway, there's a lot of things you can say that will help explain this data, um, but it's confusing to people who aren't scientists, I think. Now, this is another slide, terrible slide. Don't ever show this in a statistics class, but I'll just tell you at the long the bottom is month dates. These are separated accurately by month, going back to 2011 and going as far forward as 2013. And on the left, is the number of times a particular genetic, a particular gene was mentioned in the public media. Now this was easier to do because LexisNexis used to, you could do a search and a count and things like that. I couldn't figure out how to update this. But if I tell you what it is, you'll have to guess what's causing that spike in May of 2013. Gemini. That's right. So this is the number of times BRCA was mentioned in the media, and that's the news. Was there something discovered newsworthy? Was there a new something? No, there was Angelina Jolie. And if you want to get depressed, you public communication of science people, which I am too, look at the two little peaks around September, October of 2011 and 2012. You know what those are? Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So, Angelina Jolie, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I, I mean, for when anyway, stop there, Joe. Um, now, why do stories get on the air anyway if they're science stories? Well, I was explaining to a group of uh, postbacks, I love that term, postbacks this morning, that a lot of times the reason stories get on the air is that I get interested in them but I have no idea whether they're gonna be inter interesting to anybody else, but I'm gonna try my darndest to make them interesting to somebody else. Now this has to do with the um, uh, electronic, electric dipole moment of the neutron. Raise your hand if you've always been interested in the electric dipole moment of the neutron. Not really. But I read this press release, you know, I get tons of press releases and I read this press release and it said, Finding this out, finding an electric dipole moment of the neutron will help us understand, us physicists, understand why the universe exists. And the reason, I'll give you the punchline now, is that in the Big Bang, or the initial burst of energy that brought the universe into appearance in the first place, there was matter and antimatter. And they were presumably in equal amounts, and if that had been the case, they would have just canceled each other out and you'd have a big ball of light and it would be all over. But there was an asymmetry between the amount of matter and the amount of adding matter. And so everything that you see in the universe is based on that violation of symmetry. Where is it coming from? Why does it happen? And why is the electric dipole moment of the neutron going to tell you anything about it? Well, this gets into where I do a little bit of hand raising, but hand waving. But the answer has to do with, if it doesn't have a dipole moment, that means it's not part of the violation of symmetry that would explain the universe. But if it does, then you can dig deeper and think, why does it have it? When did it develop it? How big is it? And you can start making predictions. I thought it's pretty cool. But then I'm faced with the question of, hey, everybody, I've got a story about the electric dipole moment of the neutron. Not a good idea to go into a newsroom with that as your first pitch. So I went into the newsroom and I said, I've got a story about why corned beef sandwiches exist. <laughs> and I thought, so corned beef sandwiches and the rest of the universe too. And that got people's attention. And this, the only reason I find this so, I love this slide, makes me hungry every time I look at it. But the other thing about this particular story is that it got more hits than any other story I did that year. And again, is that right? I don't know if it's that right. This is another one of those strange stories. Did an interview, is one of the last things I did. I traveled once during COVID for NPR. I went to Galveston, Texas to talk to a guy who was doing um, assays for Pfizer. Uh, but on my way back to the airport, I stopped off at uh, Peter Hotez and um, Marielena Botazzi's lab. And I'd talked to them before because he got me interested in a hookworm vaccine that he'd been working on when he was here in GW. 
anyway, now he's, he could tell somebody's a media junkie or there's another word I might use when they've got a backdrop in their office and TV lights, but he had those, he was ready, he's ready, you know, you, you got a camera, I'm ready for you. But he, he's, a, he's a good, he's, his, I think his heart's in the right place. Anyway, I stopped off at their offices in July of 2021, and he was telling me about this vaccine that he had made, that uh, they had made, um, that was going to be easier to manufacture than an RNA, uh, RNA vaccine, and that, um, that it would be possible to use yeast, and, and you could, developing countries would have an easier time of making this, and he was giving it to them royalty-free and whatever. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. And I, I couldn't think of a news peg because there were a lot of people doing a lot of vaccines at the time. And then in December of that year, someone told me, oh, he's gotten uh, approval or not approval, but uh, authorization from the Indian government to sell this vaccine in India. And I, oh, news peg, okay. So I did the story and it was a lovely story. I'm very proud of it. But this page went up to accompany the radio story. And I have no idea why, but it got 1.3 million hits, which is for NPR, unbelievable. And I can tell you that in, for almost all of 2022, it was the most viewed page on NPR's website. More even, and this was a good one for me, more even than Steve Inskeep's interview with Donald Trump. And it only got beaten out by what's the rate of COVID in my neighborhood, which was being updated every, people were going back to it a lot. So why did this happen? I don't know. And that's one of the things that's crazy about the media is I just, I don't know. People say, how do you know what's important to people? How do you know what people will look at? I don't know. I keep throwing stuff. One thing I do know is when they, they, when they had a discussion in the, in the social media domain of NPR, they said, oh, we had great search engine optimization. It was a great picture and it was there. nobody said a word about editorial <laughs> that had almost not they didn't care <laughs> wasn't a, they didn't care if it was a good story or not got a lot of hits okay effective communication we're going to run run to the end because i see i'm running a little long to be an effective communicator you've got to know your audience you've got to know who you're talking to you got to don't dumb it down i hate that word or hate that phrase dumb it down that's not dumb I could talk to you about things. I didn't say you're all dumb because you don't know what the electric dipole moment of the neutron is. So don't assume that somebody who doesn't know what DNA is dumb. Don't be condescending. And then um, a friend of mine uh, who's a puppeteer at NPR made these and I said, oh, let's do some videos. So I'm gonna force you to watch two of them. Two of them. They're very short, don't worry. Hi, I'm science correspondent Joe Palka. A lot of people say scientists aren't good communicators, and I say that's not so. It's just sometimes scientists forget who their audience is. Consider this scene. What'll it be, Professor? I'd like two scrambled eggs, bacon, and toast, and black coffee with sugar. Okay, coming up. See? Easy. And here's what scientists don't do. What'll it be, Professor? I'd like 57 grams of heat-denatured emulsified ovalbumin an excision of sodium nitrate cured porcine abdominal wall, two flat polyhedrons of fermented triticum estivum subjected to the Maillard reaction, and a beaker of steam extracted coffee arabica with four grams of glucopyranosyl fructoferanoside. When scientists order breakfast, they're not dumbing down their message. They're using language that's appropriate for the circumstances. If scientists want to get better at communicating their science, they're going to have to use language that gets their meaning across without providing so much detail. Actually, can you hold the glucopyranosyl fructoferanoside? I'm on a diet. All right, we could do that. Um, somebody asked me when I learned to be a ventriloquist. And I thought, I thought that was very funny. <laughs> Okay, and the other film I'm going to show you has to do with jargon. There's one thing I can tell you about jargon when you're talking to the public. Don't use it. Hi, I'm NPR science correspondent Joe Palka. 
Good science journalism usually means eliminating jargon. Maybe you should have thought of that before doing a story about a Frank Casper Sigma phase and sphere forming block copolymer melts. Yeah, probably. But what about when jargon doesn't sound like jargon? Like this. Hi, Joe. What? Question for you. Do you have a plastic brain? What are you, go, what are you talking about? Go away. Joe, Joe, are you dating anything? Come on, what do you mean anything? Anyway, I'm married. Hey, Joe. What? Is that an asteroid belt you're wearing? Oh. Why, yes, it is. Obviously, astronomers mean something different than fashionistas when they talk about an asteroid belt. And for geologists, when they talk about dating, they're talking about the age of rocks. And for neuroscientists, having a plastic brain is a good thing. It means a brain that can adapt and respond to an injury. So it's not just jargon words you need to be careful of. It's words that mean one thing to a scientist and something else to just about all the rest of us. Hey, I have an idea. I think I'll throw coins into cracks in the earth after an earthquake. Why? Because I want to be generous. To a fault. Oh, that hurts. So we had a lot of fun doing those and um, yeah, I like them. Anyway, the only other time, I was just going to share this with you because it cracks me up. The only people who aren't required to explain what the heck they're talking about in the media are sports writers. And I'm a pretty big sports fan to some extent, but I don't know cricket very well. I've now learned a little bit about it. But what I like best about uh, this is that even the explanation doesn't make any sense. So a googly is a delivery which looks like a normal leg spinner, but actually turns towards the batman like an off break rather than away from the bat. I don't know. I'm not much clearer, but it's, a, it's an unusual delivery. It's sort of like a, a knuckleball. No, not a knuckleball, a screwball. But that probably doesn't help everybody uh, either. Anyway, my final admonishment, ad, adhor, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, encouragement is tell stories. Um, people like stories. People like to listen to stories. People like to hear about how things were discovered and why they were discovered. And, why you got interested in this particular topic and what you can do about it and what you can learn. And um, you're a long ways along on your science communication career if you just start thinking about the story that you're telling. And sometimes it's about the scientist herself. And scientists get uncomfortable because it's not about me, it's not about, it's not about me, it's about my science. Well, that's true when you're talking to a scientific audience. But when you're talking to a popular audience, it's about you. I mean, it's just like being on the radio. It's not about me. I'm just giving you the facts. No, it's about me. It's about my sense of humor. It's about my voice. I can't write myself out of the equation. And so if you're not comfortable with that, that's OK. Find another way to tell stories. But just understand that you, as a scientist, are part of the story. And it's just as well because it helps tell your story. And I think with that, I'll stop before I get into trouble. Um, before, we take any before we take any questions, we wanted to thank you for helping us reach our pledge drive goal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Um, with a tote bag and a, and a mug. A tote bag? Yeah. You shouldn't have. Yes. Look at this. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you very much. Tote bag. It's a gift bag, it's not a tote bag. <laughs> I exaggerated. Um, I'm told there's questions that can be taken. The questions having been taken. <laughs> pa don't use passive voice either. <laughs> Didn't go into that one. No? OK. Well, my favorite beer is IPA, so if you want to buy something. <laughs> uh, question. Less. Um, yeah, a great gift. What we all know is what people from NPR need is tote bags. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that actually, actually isn't my question. Unarguable points about public knowledge about science. Um, 
I'm beginning to think, though, there's a difference with our field in that we seem to be obsessed with genomic literacy for patients. And I'm wondering if that's really valid, because it doesn't seem to me that uh, quantum mechanics literacy is a prerequisite for getting an MRI scan. No. So do you have any thoughts on the fact that the, the weird way in which our field evolved towards this notion about we have to educate everybody, all the patients about genetics, so they understand exactly what we're doing? I wonder if that's really valid or if we should just say it's a good test and here's what the answer is. I, I'm, I'm inclined to say in that circumstance, when you're going to the doctor, you're not, you're, you're, already, you're not going for an education, I would think. You're going to get the therapy. What I would argue is that it's good for everyone in the society all the time to know what DNA is or to know how an MRI, what it's involving or why, you know, it, it's not necessary to know how, to, how it works to have one. I'm just talking about science literacy writ large. And it's not my, I mean, this is maybe going against your dogma or the Institute's dogma, but I don't think it's especially the calling of an HGRI scientist to explain, you know, any more than it's the immunologist's job to explain the immune system or, you know, the difference between T cells and B cells. But for people who sort of want to know what a vaccine is about, you kind of have to know a little something about the immune system. And, you know, for people who want to know, well, how do genetic tests work in the first place? You know, it would be nice if they understood why DNA contains mutations or what happens when there is a mutation or why mutations aren't always bad. Mutation is like, oh God, I've got a mutation, which made me smarter. <laughs> Not likely to happen, but you know, that's possible. So yes, I agree. I didn't plant that question either. Hi. Hi. Great talk. I have a question where you have scientists who are really good storytellers, they can engage the audience, but then superiors or you know, PIs or other people above the hierarchy look down on those people almost like they're dumbing down the science too much where they have certain expectations on how you should present the data, how you should talk about it, what, literally what words to use. So I think you're, what you're asking is also not in the academic culture to, to easily promote because if you are not sensationalizing the science to the lay person, but you're able to effectively communicate it. Some, I've experienced it where it was almost a double-edged sword, where I wasn't seen as a scientist. And that can be really emotionally damaging to someone who worked very hard for a PhD in a field that they're passionate about. So what do you think about that? How can we bridge that gap? Well, yes, I think that's a completely valid concern. And when I came out of my graduate degree and, and saw how the media worked, I spent the first year or so sputtering. But you didn't see it. And then I realized, and it's, this is, it's impossible, you, can, you cannot be expected to give the same talk to a bunch of high school students that you give to a meeting of geneticists. And that would be, nobody would expect that except somehow if you're talking to the public, you're held to this, oh, well, there might be scientists out there who would criticize you for saying it this way when it really should be said that way. And it's, I confess, I'm now immune. Scientists can refuse to give me a grant. <laughs> grant officers can refuse. They can you know, take my papers off the shelves, whatever, because it's not going to matter to me because I think they're wrong, because I'm not in that mode. So what I, the reason, one of the reasons, okay, I'm trying to do what I can to have the scientific community appreciate 
that distinction. And one of the ways that I came up with, which may or may not be helpful, is now the National Academy of Sciences gives an award to scientists who are good communicators. Now, I've actually won that same award when it was in an earlier in incarnation. So I bring that home, the National Academy of Sciences gives us award, and I bring it to my editors and they go, oh, that's nice, very nice. But they want to win a Pulitzer, and they want to win a DuPont, and they want to win you know, a journalism award. But if you're a scientist and the National Academy of Sciences says, you just won this award for communication, I'm thinking that's the currency of the realm and you can bring that into your dean or your PI or your chairman and say, hey, National Academy of Sciences thinks this is worth my time, what, what about you? It may not work. There's a lot of distrust. And I, I get it, 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 is a, it is a fine line. In my career, somebody asked me this, this is a sort of a revelation, maybe too late, <laughs> but they asked me, well, who's my audience? And I told this to the group earlier today. My audience is science phobes. I'm trying to reach people who don't like science and don't want to listen to it and couldn't care less and would rather be putting hot needles in their eyeballs. And I want them to stay and listen to what I have to say because it's going to be damn interesting and they would be missing out if they don't listen to it. I don't... I don't think you can do that as easily when you're a scientist as I can when I'm not, not being a scientist anymore. I brought my own mic. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I really appreciate that previous question. I think a lot of, especially trainees, really resonate with that as we're trying to move up in our field and feel like we're not being taken seriously just because we take the time to engage our communities. Um, so tying that in with the point you made in your talk about it being about you and your communicating, what advice do you have for uh, scientists in how to find their voice, how to bring themselves back into as they're storytelling, um, as they're sharing their data? How can you kind of rebring those worlds back together after you've spent so much time in an academic setting where it's almost stripped from you? Yeah. Well, one piece of advice that I give is don't share what you're going to say with your colleagues. <laughs> don't ask for their opinion. Don't see what they think. Because, even if they're in a different field, um, because they're, it's hard for them to let go. It's hard for anybody because they're hearing. I heard it, the voice that says, oh, you didn't really say that. You know, that, that wasn't really, you know, that voice is chronic until you get immune from it. So my advice would be to talk to people who aren't scientists. Um, it could be your mother <laughs> or, I mean, I don't know if your mother's a scientist or not, but it could be, it could be somebody, I mean, I always thought, you know, somebody who is, likes you, is interested in you, is willing to listen to you, but doesn't know anything about what you're doing because that's basically your audience. And um, we used to do this thing with Joe's Big Idea, uh, this NPR SciCommerce. Actually, I'm gonna complain now. Maddie Sophia, who is, if you ever get a chance to see her work or get to work with her, fantastic communicator. But she hated the name that I gave to the SciCommerce to begin with, which was Friends of Joe's Big Idea, which was the name of my project, Joe's Big Idea. Friends of Joe, Joe's Big Idea, which I called Fojobies. And I loved the phrase Fojobie, but she hated it because nobody knows what it means. Anyway, she, we had this thing where people would write essays, graduate students, and we would help edit them to get them into popular journals. But we had this process that she called peer editing, where they would send it out to other people who were interested in becoming good communicators. And I said, that's the worst term. It's a worse term. You don't want peers. You don't want peers. You want people who don't know what you're talking about. Now, they're not going to catch any mistakes you make in your, in your presentation. That's on you. But they'll tell you whether you understand it or not. And that's another thing is that your peers, if they don't understand it, will be embarrassed to admit that they don't understand it and won't tell you. It's a, it's a bitch. I'm sorry. 
wave if you've got the microphone because I can't tell. So what is the difference between news media and education? Well, one begins with an N and the other one begins with an E. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, come on. News, news is information and education is a process of learning. And I can, I mean, my example is I can tell you how to drive a car and what the steering wheel does and what the gas pedal does and what the brakes do. But until you get in the car and try it and drive it around a little bit, you don't, you don't understand it. And so I think with education, I mean, I learned this in organic chemistry. Oh, I get organic chemistry. That's easy. Yeah, because these things happen. I took my first test, bombed. And the reason was I did understand it, what he said, the teacher said to me, whose name, by the way, was Dr. Bond. Now, if that isn't the most appropriate name you've ever heard for an organic chemistry teacher, but I, I understood the words, but I didn't understand the concepts, and I had to go back, and actually what happened was I managed to create a metaphor in my head about clouds of electrons and how they were interacting with one another, and that helped me understand what would happen when two chemicals got together but until I came up with my own set of metaphors, which helped me understand what was going on, I only understood the words. And so education is about learning, learning something new. And news is about hearing something new. And um, um, there also is the point that, and I tell this to people, I mean, in what I do, <laughs> It's easy enough not to listen. <laughs> turn off, turn off the radio. It's easy. Um, but in class, you know, it used to be they would throw an eraser at you if you weren't listening. But I don't suppose they do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm I'm uh, fielding some questions from the audience from the Q and A, and uh, there are three. I'm gonna. There are others up, here. Try, yeah, and, and the virtual audience. Oh my God. Um, I'm gonna throw you three hear? pop culture questions. One is, how do you think the O.J. Simpson trial influenced public knowledge of DNA? Two is, have you worked with Alan Alda in the SciComm Center? And then three is, have you ever interviewed C.C. Moore, the genetic genealogist? I'll answer the last question first. No. Uh, the first question was OJ. Oh boy. Um, oh boy. I I I don't I don't know. They I I think that might be an example maybe of a situation where facts didn't necessarily inform. They just confused, and people already in some cases had made up their mind about what was the outcome. As for Alan Alda, I have a story. <laughs> so I already confessed to you that my father was a playwright. And when I was younger than before he read the DNA, Double Helix, he wrote a play called Annette and Two Guitars and it played at the Bucks County Playhouse in Pennsylvania, and it starred Alan Alda. And Alan Alda and Arlene Alda became very close friends with my parents, Alfred and Doris Palka. And then my father had a falling out with Alan over something or other, I don't remember. But a few years ago, Alan won a prize from the National Academy of Sciences for his work as a communicator. And I think he's brilliant. I'm very fond of his work. And someone told him that I was in the audience at that same garden party. Uh, it was the garden party. And the message, he was there with Arlene. And when he saw, when she saw me, she said, Joey Palka because that's how I was known back when they knew me. <laughs> but they were very sweet. And uh, Alan, uh, yeah, he, it's funny. I mean, it's so weird that w we were connected. I went with my dad once to lunch with him, and then he, we dropped him off at the stage door, and he went on stage for a Broadway play. It was fun. I like that. 
a couple more from the virtual crew and I'm going to lump these two together. Um, looking back, is there a story that you wish you had written about something that somebody people sh- or that some that people should have understood better and or a time that you were frustrated or surprised about how difficult it was to communicate a story? Well, I mean, I don't have any trouble figuring out what story I found difficult to explain, and that's quantum physics. <laughs> if I had to do the cat is dead or cat is alive one more time, I was going to yeah. blow my brains out. I don't understand quantum physics. I don't understand why a quantum computer is going to be so much better than a non-quantum computer. I tried. I said the words, <laughs> but um, I don't get it. The other one I vowed never, ever, ever, ever to do again is to try to explain optical interferometry on the radio. <laughs> never. Uh-uh. Don't do it. Okay. Um, so, um, like, working in, like, NPR, I'm, I'm pretty sure you, like, you're in, like, a unique position where you're... Your, like your your audience is of like multiple like levels of education, right? Mm-hmm. And so, throughout the talk, right, I feel like a lot as at least from my perspective, like a lot of, like a lot about like science communication is like 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 targeting your your audience. But like, what? How do you as as a drone right as like like working at like NPR? What's your like how do you target multiple audiences with with one thing when there's like multiple levels of of education that you can target? Well, and it's, it's a perfectly valid, important question, which I was trying to get at with this thing about what people know in the audience. But the answer is, I can't. I. I have a little, I have a buffer going in my brain when I'm talking. (laughs) And it's sort of a buffer that's screening for jargon and screening for terms that I don't think most kids would know. Now, it doesn't tell me all the things they know that I don't know, which is unfortunate. (laughs) But, But I have that going. And when I hear myself saying something about anything, I mean, like I was trying to think during this talk what I wouldn't have said to an audience of high school students. And I'm guessing, I mean, part of the reason I don't feel like I have to explain what the electric dipole moment of the neutron is, is that I don't, it's not really the story about the electric dipole moment of the neutron, it's something obscure. And I would explain it to you if it was important to the point I was trying to make. But I think I would say just about the same thing except that I would remind my, try to remind myself that um, you know, they don't know what tests are going to be like, or they don't know what a PI, I mean, in this audience, a P, PI, I'm not going to use the term PI um, in front of every audience. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> an R01 grant, I'm not going to, you know, I know that jargon. Um, but really, you don't, you don't have to, um, use long words if you give a good explanation for something. And so I, I think people, you know, I, 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 nobody's, I mean, well, I haven't been accused of being completely impossible to understand, so that is lucky, but maybe I'm done hearing from those people. But I also haven't been accused of making it so dumb, simple, that I'm obscuring important points. It's a, It's a game. It's a there's, and there's no there's there's no way to know if you've won or not because you don't you don't get to talk to the audience. But yeah, you, you have to sort of ask your own ask yourself questions. If I heard that, would I know what I was talking about? Sorry, can't be better than that. Yes, um, it's kind of a hot topic, so I'm sure you get a question about this often. But what role do you think large language models and AI should serve in science communication? Well, if they help uh, come up with good metaphors, I mean, I'll, there's, a, there's an expression <laughs> that good journalists borrow and great journalists steal. <laughs> and if I see something that I think is really brilliant and that it works and resonates with my understanding of the truth, 
I want to use it. I, I'm, not, I'm not the sole generator of every good idea that's out there. So I'm happy to have someone, you know, say, well, you can think of it like this. Oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. The trouble is that if you don't understand the topic that you're accepting the metaphor for, you might be accepting a completely bogus metaphor, in which case, bad. But. Okay, I think we have time for probably, oh, do you want to go ahead? Just one yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, it's go ahead. Part, it's not a question, it's an idea. Ooh. So we have DNA Day here at NIH, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Bring your kid today. Mm -hmm. Bring your kids to work day. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking with your Joe Big Idea mm -hmm. podcast or whatever, how about bring a kid scientist podcast to the NPR where the kid will come in, she, she or he will tell you what specific scientist they want to be. And I'm pretty sure they can explain it better than a PhD scientist. <laughs> and coming from a kid, there's going to be excitement, enthusiasm, and they're going to be very confident about their science careers. And you're going to be building scientists. Yep. Beautiful. I have two answers to that question. One is, I don't work at NPR anymore. And two, if you've been reading the newspaper, NPR is in crisis. And starting a podcast, which I thought about doing, is monstrously difficult right now. I mean, it was, would have been a great idea 20 years ago, but NP, 20 years ago, NPR wouldn't have been interested because they were thinking podcasts weren't going to last. That was the insight of the company then. Um, it's a good idea. The, the, tr the, the, the real answer is I've worked for 30 years <laughs> at NPR. Good luck to them, you know. <laughs> That's my feeling. Sorry. Uh, the, that's a good a good place to to close up. So Christina is gonna. I love NPR, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice place. I enjoyed my time there a whole lot. I just I'm I'm I've done my bit for them. Was that in the NDA? <laughs> <laughs> um, I never did sign an NDA. <laughs> Well, this concludes um, the lecture, and we really appreciate you coming. Let's give um, Dr. Paltrow one last round of applause. We'd also like to thank the Education and Community Involvement Branch, as well as the Communications Branch, for all the work they did for all the DNA Week events, um, especially Roseanne Wise. This is, I know this is her, her baby every year. So thank you all so much, and thank you. All right.